Eight-year-old Ethel Smythe writes in her diary that when she grows up, she wants to be made a peer for her musical prowess. She would go on to write six operas and, in 1922, receive a damehood for her work in music, the first woman to ever do so. But just because of that, I don't want you to think that she's some stuffy high-class snob. No, no. She is a window-smashing, opera-kidnapping, anthem-riding bad bitch with many, many lovers, only one of them being a male. So join me as we look at, quite frankly, Ethel was born on the 22nd of April, 1858, in Kent, and was the fourth of eight children. Her father was a major general in the Royal Artillery and was involved in putting down the 1857 Indian Mutiny. A real man's man. The type of man who, in 1873, when Ethel told him that she wished to move to Leipzig and study music at the conservatory, wasn't exactly thrilled. Music is no career for a self-respecting woman. Absolutely not. Well, what is a respectable career? Marriage. Ew. Ethel wasn't the type of person who just accepted what they were told. So, for the next two years, she argued with her father until he finally conceded. Ethel was finally free of her father's clutches and able to fully commit herself to music. This sucks. Ethel studied for a year at the Leipzig Conservatory before leaving, finding the teachers to be insufficient. She began receiving private tutoring until the 1880s when she started to build her career. But every time she wrote something, this would happen. Hey music critics, I wrote this opera that is energetic, loud and virile. I hope you like it. Mmm. Such music is unnatural. Oh yes, yes, quite. It's most unbecoming of a woman to write with such strong themes. <sighs> well, I wrote this opera that's graceful, soft and sentimental. <laughs> See, these women composers are no match for us men. <laughs> no, no indeed. This is clearly parlor music made for little girls to listen to at home, not for real music. Her music did have its supporters, however, and almost everything she wrote was performed. In 1903, she was the first female composer to have her work performed at the Metropolitan Opera House, New York. It's here that we really start to hear about her uncompromising and honestly eccentric nature. One story says that when a reporter arrived to interview her, he found her tied to a tree, apparently in order to improve her posture for when she is conducting. And in 1906, when she discovered that changes had been made to a performance of her opera, The Wreckers, she walked into the orchestra pit, took all the sheet music and fled from Leipzig to Prague, leaving the opera just unable to go ahead. In 1910, at age 52, she joined the Suffragettes and put her musical career on hold for two years. She composed the anthem March of the Women, which was first played in 1911 to celebrate the release of suffragettes from prison. In 1912, more than 150 suffragettes took part in a protest. This protest was simple. Emmeline Pankhurst started by throwing stones at 10 Downing Street and other suffragettes smashed windows along major thoroughfares. Ethel's target was the house of Colonial Secretary Lewis Hardcourt, who had said, If all the beauty and wisdom of my wife was present in all women, they would have already won the right to vote. Which doesn't sound too bad considering the time, but don't worry, he was also a disgusting human. When she got to the square, however, she found a policeman standing watch. Who lives in that house? Oh, that would be Mr. Simmons, I believe, ma'am. And this one? Lord Harcourt, ma'am. Will you come quietly? Yes. The suffragettes were arrested and sent to Holloway Prison. Ethel would serve two months before being released on mental health grounds. She would later reflect that the prison had poor sanitary conditions, with cockroaches present even in the hospital ward but that she was in good company of united women putting the cause they were imprisoned for before their personal needs. In fact, when her friend Thomas Beecham came to visit Ethel, he found her to be conducting the other inmates from her window with a toothbrush as they sung the March of the Women. At the outbreak of the First World War, the suffragettes suspended their activities to focus on supporting the war effort, a move Ethel disagreed with. During the war, Ethel trained as a radiographer in Paris, although she struggled with the work as she'd begun to lose her hearing. 
As the war was winding down in 1918, the Representation of the People Act was passed, allowing women over the age of 30 to vote, which eventually led to English women gaining the same voting rights as men in 1928. She was made a dame in 1922 and received honorary degrees from Durham and Oxford. Right, now on to the really juicy stuff. Ethel had a lot of affairs, mostly with women, the most famous of which being Emmeline Pankhurst, who she'd met through the suffragette movement. This rumour was started by Virginia Woolf when she wrote, In strict confidence, Ethel used to love Emmeline. They shared a bed. She also supposedly had an affair with the Bishop of Truro's wife before the bishop's daughter stole her away. She reportedly only ever slept with one man, Henry Brewster, whom she had a long relationship and lifelong friendship with, while also having relationships with his wife and sister-in-law. In a letter to Brewster, she said, I wonder why it is so much easier for me to love my own sex more passionately than yours. Not all of her affections were reciprocated, however, for upon meeting and falling in love with Virginia Woolf, a woman 25 years her junior, Woolf wrote in her diary, an old woman of 71 has fallen in love with me. It's like being caught by a giant crab. However, later on, Woolf would go on to write about Ethel. How we differ, our minds are two entirely and integrally different, which is why we get on. In her later years, Ethel would go completely deaf and begin writing several books and memoirs, although she never lost her eccentricity. She reportedly would never leave the house without the company of her dog, which, fair enough, and was prone to showing up at people's houses without warning, expecting to be entertained. Basically, she was an introvert's worst nightmare. About her death, she said that she was worried about her musical legacy, that her music would die with her and be forgotten, which for a while happened. For decades after her death in 1944, her works fell out of the limelight and this amazing woman's legacy was almost lost. Until recently, in the last few years, her works have been working their way back into the public eye. In 2018, the March of the Women was performed by multiple groups to mark the centenary of women winning the right to vote. The symphony, The Prison, also won a Grammy in 2021, and in 2022, her opera, The Wreckers, opened the Glyndon Festival, proving that a character such as Ethel refuses to be forgotten by history. Also, the decades of hard work in the classical and operatic scene for more inclusion are working, or whatever. 